Thank you for joining us today. In today's webinar, we will be diving into taxes and retirement. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Sean Clark and Chris Maxey are investment advisors with Brookstone Financial. Brookstone advisors have been featured in the USA Today and the Wall Street Journal. You can hear Sean and Chris on the radio every Thursday morning at 8 a.m. on Money Talk 1010 a.m. and 92.1 FM. Let's go ahead and get into it. Your first speaker today is Mr. Sean Clark. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. And uh, we're excited that you're here with us. Uh, it's, a, it's a different world right now with COVID-19 oh, yeah. and coronavirus. And we just appreciate your time to learn a little bit more about taxes in retirement. And so we'll jump right in here and uh, I'll start with this question. Has anyone ever done a puzzle? Uh, a jigsaw puzzle like this. Uh, most people have seen puzzles like this, have done a puzzle like this. And I'm going to start with this question. What do you think is the most important piece of a puzzle? What's the most important piece? And so oftentimes when I ask this question, I get answers like uh, the corner piece or the edge piece. That's where you start usually. Or um, a really creative answer is the last piece. And I have two kids, uh, ages two and four, and I have a puzzle that I know um, one of the puzzle pieces is missing, so we're missing the last piece. Um, but uh, I would argue that the most important piece of the puzzle is actually not a piece at all. It's the picture on the box. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, here's a thousand piece puzzle. Can you imagine doing a thousand piece puzzle without that picture on the box? It would be nearly impossible. And so what we're going to talk today is about taxes in retirement. But it's nearly impossible to talk about taxes in retirement unless we talk about retirement planning. I mean, how much are you going to, if we don't know how much you're going to make in retirement, we don't know how much uh, you're going to be charged in taxes in retirement. And so we feel like having a plan is so, so, so important in, in um, figuring out what your tax implications will be in retirement. And so what we'll be talking, you'll hear me say the word retirement planning or plan probably 50 times during this presentation, primarily because we think it is so important. It's that picture on the box, if you will, of that puzzle. And typically the first step in uh, creating that picture on the box is choosing a guide to help guide you through that process. I want to illustrate this with a story about a guy by the name of Bill Metzger, true story, real guy. These are not his actual pictures. And uh, Bill retired at the age of 46 in Kansas. Uh, anybody want to take a guess on how he did that? Well, we can't hear you, so I don't know what you're saying, but he actually retired as a, uh, a software. He built and sold a software company out of Kansas of all places. But he retired with $2 million at the age of 46. Not, not a bad retirement, though. Great. So uh, he retires at 46, but Bill didn't know money. So he decided to hire an investment advisory firm to help guide him through the process. So he interviewed Wall Street firm after Wall Street firm and finally chose the one that said that uh, they were going to give him direct access to their A team, that he was going to get direct access to some of their best advisors and best analysts on their team. So that's why he went to, with this. Now this was this, the year of this was 2006. 2006 was a pretty good market year, but anything wrong with 2006? You probably guessed it. Uh, yeah, 2008 was right around the corner. And so what do you think happened to, to Bill's accounts in 2008? The same thing that happened to, to many of your accounts, I'm sure they began to drop. So again, Bill didn't know money. He was told, your accounts are supposed to grow. We're going to create income. And think about it. Bill was only 46 years old. He's got a long time. So he's, And so he, he calls us the investment advisory term firm. What do you think his advisor told him? Yeah, don't worry about that. That's just paper loss. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, it always comes back. Well, by the end of 2008, Bill had lost 900 thousand dollars. Great. Yeah. So, and what was worse, he called his advisor and learned his, uh, his advisor had left that for months ago. So Bill is furious. He, he, he's lost nearly half his money. The A team has vanished. And so he's, he not only fires the, the brokerage company, but he, he decides to actually go ahead and sue. Anybody 
Ever heard of anyone suing Wall Street and winning? Well, it doesn't happen often, but but Bill won. So how much did he lose? $900,000. Well, well, how much do you think he recovered in the lawsuit? Well, the judge ruled and Bill was awarded $10,000. And the reason I tell you this story is because the judge looks at Bill and he says, Bill, not one member of your investment advisory firm, not one member of your A team had a legal responsibility to put your best interest first. Not one member had a legal responsibility to put your best interest first. In our industry, we call that a fiduciary, a fiduciary. That's someone who is required by law to act in the best interest of their clients. Now, uh, Chris and I hold our series 65 license. You probably never heard of that. You have no reason to have heard of that. But what it does is it makes Chris and I a fiduciary. And what's interesting is that less than 8% of uh, the people in our industry hold that license. And what it requires us to do is to act in the best interest of our clients. So when you're putting together your plan, when you're putting together your retirement plan, your tax plan, we feel it is so, so, so important that you are working with somebody who is a fiduciary, not someone that just says they have your best interest at heart, but someone who um, has a legal responsibility to have. And we think that is so, so, so important. So in choosing that guide, it's so important that you work with a fiduciary. And, and so what makes us different here at, at Brookstone Financial is we pri primarily focus on planning. We, we put together retirement plans where we pull together your social security and your assets. And we overlay that over your goals to make sure that you're never going to run out of money and that you're being as efficient as you possibly could be in retirement. So we focus on planning, not product sales. The plan dictates uh, the financial solutions that'll work best. So listen, uh, we would love the opportunity to sit down with you. And, uh, and what often happens with these webinars, we're going to be talking a lot about taxes. We're going to be talking a lot about strategies on how to save money on taxes in retirement and in passing assets to the next generation. And, but what we can't talk about is your specific situation because we don't know you. So what we would like to do, we found that most people were leaving these webinars with more questions than answers. So kind of out of necessity, we created um, what's called a, a lab session. Um, do you remember in chemistry class when uh, you know you had the lecture portion, which was probably my least favorite portion, <laughs> but then you have the uh, lab session where you can dissect the frog and actually interact. Well, this lab session is where we answer all of your questions and, uh, and, 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 and it's great because we answer your personal financial questions. Um, it's of no cost to you. And so what we're going to do throughout the presentation is you're going to see this little pop up. I'm going to go ahead and put it up right now. It's going to slide over the screen and you'll see Chris and I's faces there. And if you click that little green box that says click here, exclamation point, um, you can get that will send you to our calendar and you can schedule an hour block where you can ask us your questions from this webinar. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can click that. If not, uh, just go ahead and click that X at the top right hand of that slide out and that will get it out of the way um, so we can get back to the presentation. But uh, we'll be sliding that out throughout so you can schedule that at any point throughout the presentation. So um, without further ado, I think you're ready to hear a little bit about the new tax laws and Chris is going to take it from here. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, Sean is absolutely right. Um, we're going to talk about your new tax laws right now. So to do that, I first want to ask you, who knows what the, the name of this new tax law is? It actually went into place in 2017, and it's called the Jobs Act of 2017. And it actually went into effect in 2018. So the big thing is a lot of people are asking, is this set to expire or is it going to last forever? The answer is it's going to expire in 2025. A lot of experts are talking and they're seeing what this is actually going to cost the, the U.S. government. And I'll give you a hint. It's, it's over a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, It's over a billion dollars. We're talking, it's, it, they're estimating that it's going to be $1.5 trillion dollars. Uh, as a cost to the U.S. government. But what does that mean for us as citizens? Well, let's let's get into it here a little bit. 
So the first thing that I want you to look at is on the left side of your screen, this 10, 15, 25, 28, uh, and so forth. That is the, the income tax bracket that everybody is very familiar with. Well, if you'll look at the right side of the screen, you'll see 10, 12, 22, 24, and so forth. Well, what we know is that a majority of Americans fall in this 15, 25, and 28% tax bracket. So if you go over to the right side of the screen, you'll see that for most Americans, now they're in the 12, the 22, and the 24% tax bracket. So you've fallen in. So, so tax rates have actually dropped between 3 and 4% for a large portion of the U.S. population. What we're seeing is that taxes are actually on sale right now, and they're on sale until 2025, right? So, and, and if we look at this, uh, the difference between the 25 and the 22% tax bracket is that previously it was it was capped at 156,000. Well, if we go over to the 22% tax bracket, that has now expanded to 165,000 dollars. If you look at the 28% tax bracket, that was previously 237,000. Well, now again, that has expanded to 315,000. So again, more Americans are falling into this 12. 22 and 24% tax bracket. And what we're seeing is that for personal income taxes, that taxes are actually on sale. So who knows what's going on with the, uh, with the standard deduction? Did it go up? Did it go down? Did it stay the same? Well, we're actually seeing that it has, in many cases, almost doubled. So for an individual, it previously was about $6,300. Well, now we're seeing that it's expanded to about $12,000. And for a married couple filing jointly, it was almost $13,000. Well, now it has expanded to be about to be $24,000. And what we're also seeing is that the personal exemption that used to be $4,000 has gone away, right? It's been gobbled up by the standard deduction. So we're seeing that the standard deduction has increased and the personal exemption has actually been done away with. So what does this actually mean for us as citizens? Well, who, you know, who in here has, has year after year done your itemized deductions? Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know I have right year after year, you're continuing to do your itemized deductions. Well, what we're seeing is that simply might not make sense anymore. What we're seeing is that a lot of individuals aren't deducting over $12,000 and a lot of married couples, aren't deducting over $24,000. So you might be able to save yourself some time and some headaches and not have to do this anymore, right? The other thing that we're seeing is if you are giving to charities simply for tax purposes, that might not make sense. It simply might not make sense anymore. And I'm not saying don't give, keep it all to yourself. You know, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is, if you're giving simply for tax purposes to drop into the next tax bracket, well, it simply might not make sense because a lot of times people aren't able to give over $24,000 to bring them into the next tax bracket. So this is something to definitely consider when doing your taxes from here on out. So here is one of the most recent changes and one of the largest, biggest changes that, that we're actually seeing. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we've seen in decades. So if you miss everything that we say, don't miss this right here, right? The SECURE Act is a huge change to your retirement and to your children's retirement. So this actually went into effect on December 20th of 2019. And to be honest with you, a lot of people haven't heard about it. A lot of people don't know about it because it was right before Christmas, the impeachment was going on, and now we've fallen into the, the COVID-19 thing. So, so there's a lot, been a lot of stuff going on, and this has not gotten a lot of press. So listen to what we're saying here. So RMDs, RMDs have moved to age 72. RMD stands for Required Minimum Distributions. And this, RMDs impact your 401ks, your 403bs, your IRAs, what we call tax deferred vehicles. You put money in and you don't pay tax on that money when you put it in. However, it grows. When it grows, 
after that, you take the money out after it has grown and you pay taxes on it then. So previously, your RMDs would be at 70 and a half. Well, with this new tax law, it actually has been extended to 72 years old. There's actually some really neat solutions and some really neat strategies that we're implementing for our clients to make sure that they are um, getting the most out of these accounts. So we could talk about that later. But one of the other things is that you can now previously contributing to traditional IRAs, you previously could not contribute to them after 70 and a half. Well, now again, you that they have extend that to where you could continue to, to put into your four, your IRAs anytime after 70 and a half. We don't really see this as much of an opportunity, but it's something that the government has done as well. And here, the, the biggest change that we're seeing is, is with the inherited IRA changes. This is huge, folks, right? There is going to be a massive, um, massive amount of wealth being transferred from one generation to the other generation in the next 30 years. And this right here is where the IRS is going to take full advantage of that. So in previous tax law, as of before December 20th, 2019, let's say that you have an IRA or a 401k. Well, when you pass away, you would give that to your, let's say you give that to your kids or the next generation. Well, then your kids, your next generation would have their entire life to take RMDs out of that. So they would have, and lots of times that happens when, you know, you pass away in your 70s or 80s, your child is in their 50s or 60s. And then they have 20, 30, 40 years to take out of that RM, to take RMDs out of that. Well, with this new inherited IRAs, those 40 years now become 10 years. 10 years. That is huge, right? That is a massive change. So they have to take 10% out of your IRAs, 401ks, anything that is tax deferred. 10% a year, or if they're simply not planners, they can kick that off to the 10th year. And then they have to take all of it out, which would move them up to the highest tax bracket potentially. Yeah, pay tax on all of it. And pay tax on yeah. all of it. it. Yeah. So this is a huge place where the IRS is going to, to get those taxes. So this is something that if you don't learn anything at all, this is a huge thing that you definitely should look into uh, to determine you know, if you have a large portion of your net worth in, and if you've worked really hard to, I know you have, you've worked really hard to earn those funds. Well, potentially if you pass away and pass the assets to the next generation, uh, the IRS is going to take a large portion of that. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to have Sean, we have a whole presentation on social security, but I'm going to have Sean talk a little bit about that here. Yeah, so like Chris said, we have a whole presentation just on Social Security. However, tonight or today, I'm just going to focus primarily on the taxation of uh, Social Security. And so, uh, you know, with Social Security, you've paid into Social Security your whole life. Your whole life you've paid into Social Security. And what we find oftentimes is that, that people spend more time planning their summer vacation than they spend making one of the largest financial decisions yeah. that many Americans will make in their yeah. entire life. So, so I want to talk a little bit about this. We're going to go over the basics of social security and then we'll get into the taxation of social security. So what is the earliest you can take social security? Well, that, that age is age 62, but when is your full retirement age? And some may be saying 66 and some may be saying 67 and, and you may both be right because it's a little bit of a trick question. So if you're born between 1943 and 1954, your full retirement age is 66. However, if you're born after 1954, it's a sliding scale uh, where for every year after 1954, you're born, it adds two months to your full retirement age. So what I mean by that is that if you're born in 1955, your full retirement age will be 66 and two months, 56, 66 and four months, all the way to 1960. If you're born after 1960, your full retirement age will be 67. So why is that important? Your full retirement age is when you will collect what's called your PIA. Now there's probably uh, many things that PIA stands for, but in this case, when we're talking about social security. We're talking about the primary insurance amount, and that's the number at the top right hand corner of your social security statement. So if you get that social security statement, 
I don't know, this is a social security statement, I guess. Um, in the top right hand corner, uh, you will see a, a number, a monthly number. That is your PIA. If you take your social security at your full retirement age, you will uh, receive that amount. That is your, your PIA. Now, uh, can you delay your social security? Yeah, yeah, you can. So what happens if you delay it? Well, you'll see from this that if you delay it, now you get a little bit. Well, actually, if you take it early, there's a penalty. Yeah, there is a catch to taking it early. If you take it at 62, you are only getting 75% of your PIA, 75% of your PIA. So it's a 25% uh, penalty, essentially, of what you would get if you waited to your full retirement age. In this example, this individual's full retirement age is 66. So at 66, they get their um, full benefit. Now, you can you delay it after? Sure. And what happens? Well, you get a little bit more. Actually, you get a lot more. 8% simple interest roll up guaranteed by your federal government. Where else can you get a guaranteed 8% right That's now? Big. That's I huge. mean, you go to the bank and talk about guaranteed products, you're talking 1%, 2% yeah. on the month. So this is all something to take into effect. Um, when you're talking about social security, it's not just a decision on, well, I need the income. Maybe I should take it now. Well, it's all about coordinating it with your other assets. So, so, so important. It's all about taking your social security income, a question and putting that into context with your other assets because we take into effect, well, how long do you plan to live? Obviously none of us know that, nor would you want to know that, but we take into effect longevity. We take into effect what are interest rates right now? Well, if we can go to the bank and get an 8%, maybe it makes sense to take the Social Security and have our money at the bank earning 8 But we haven't seen 8% at the bank in a long time. Sure. And interest rates right now are lower than they've ever been. So would you rather get 1% at the bank or 8% for delaying your Social Security? It's something to definitely keep in mind. So that Social Security question is certainly one that you should, I mean, it's worth probably 30 minutes um, talking to a professional uh, when we're talking about one of the largest financial decisions of your life. And let's be honest, if you call the social security office and you ask the same question three times, how many answers are you going to get? You're going to get three. Yeah, probably not yeah. three different answers. Yeah. And that's not really their fault. I mean, the social security is underfunded. So they're cutting jobs. They're hiring new people that don't know the rules and they're doing the best they can, but they just don't know. And they just don't know. We have a big advantage as the president of our company, Seth Stewart, used to actually travel around and, and train advisors on the area of social security. So we work together as a team and Seth usually puts together our social security plans of the, of an individual's planning process. So that's the basics on social security. Again, that's real basic because we have a whole presentation just on social security, but I want to get into the taxation of social security. So how is social security taxed? You may not even know that it is taxed. Well, it is. You paid tax on it when you were working and you're going to pay tax on it when you earn it. And yep. It's kind of a weird deal, but this is just how it works. So, uh, your social security tax is based on your income. Okay. But it's not your adjusted gross income or your gross income. That's everybody's used to. It's based on your provisional income. So you want to know what provisional income is? The answer is almost always never. I mean, uh, provisional income, I, I promise you, they've tried to make this as confusing as possible, but provisional income is your gross income plus half of your social security benefit. Okay, gross income plus half of your social security benefit makes up your provisional income. So if you're married filing jointly, here's the breakdown. We have a, a real nice sheet that has all this on it. And if you'll send us your email, we'd be glad to send us uh, this sheet. If you go to brookstonefinancial.com and give us your email, we can send you this uh, 2020 taxation and retirement guide. It has all this information all in a nice, easy cheat sheet. Yep. Um, but if, if we, as long as we have your email, we can send you that. But if you're married and filing jointly, if you make less than $32,000, none of your social security is taxed. However, if you make 32 to 44, half, it's a huge jump. Half of your social security is taxed at your, uh, at your tax bracket. If you make more than $44,000 of provisional income, well, 85% of your social security is taxed. So this is, it is a big jump. And if you could avoid that, it'd be great to avoid it. So let me show you how this works. So let's say uh, you're clipping along and uh, you make $20,000 of gross income in retirement. You make another $20,000 of Social Security. So your provisional income would be what? Remember, it's half of the Social Security. So it would be 
30,000. So remember what I said before, if it's under 32,000, how much do you pay on social, on tax on your social security? Nothing, nothing. You don't pay anything in tax on your social security. However, let's say you're clipping along. You're not paying any tax on your social security. Everything's going fine. And then you turn 72. Remember Chris talking about 72. That's an important age. What happens at age 72? You have to take what's called a required minimum distribution from your 401k or your IRA. You've been kicking that tax can down the road. Now the IRS says, Hey, we want that money. So you have to take a portion out of your IRA and pay tax on it. So let's say that R&D is $5,000. So you have to take, now your gross income goes up to $25,000 that you're paying tax on. Now your social security is still paying you 20, but now how much is your provisional income? It jumped up to 35. What happens when it goes over 32? Half of your social security benefit is taxed. In the 12% tax bracket, that's an additional $1,200 in tax. That's massive. Yeah, it's huge. Just because of a, a $5,000 RMD. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a huge amount of taxation. And the only way we can figure this out is with a retirement plan. So let's look at uh, what happens if you have a big RMD. Say you've got a lot of money in your 401k or IRA and you have a $15,000 RMD. Well, that bumps you up to $35,000 in gross income. Still get your 20 of Social Security. Now you're at $45,000. Now, 85% of your Social Security is taxed. That's an additional $2,040 in tax. There's no way you can plan for this on an Excel sheet. I mean, it's impossible. And we don't use an Excel sheet. We don't use, we use some pretty advanced software to make this calculation a very simple and easy to understand one. But we can see how much of your Social Security will be taxed by projecting out your income over your lifetime. So listen, if you've never sat down to put together a Social Security strategy, I mean, we're talking about a decision that is probably worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's probably worth a 30 minute conversation to make sure you're getting the most of what you've paid into. Now I want to talk about the earnings test. This isn't actually anything to do with uh, social security, but it does affect your social security where it could reduce part, if not all. So 18,240, that's an important number. So if you take your social security early before your full retirement age, say you take it at 62 or 63. Well, if you make, over 18,000 in earned income. If you make over 18,000 earned income for every $2 over, you lose a dollar of your social security. They just won't pay it out. So uh, they just don't pay it out. So we get people all the time saying, well, I took social security at 62 thinking, well, I better get it before it runs out, but I'm still working my full-time job and I haven't received my social security check. Well, how much money do you make? Well, I make $80,000. Well, you're not going to receive a social security check because you make well over the earnings test and it's eliminated all of your social security benefit. So listen, don't get caught up in the earnings test. Know what that is because this is a huge, huge, uh, I mean, your, your earning potential on your social security will likely be a six figure, uh, dollar amount. So you want to make a good decision on that. So if you never talked to anybody and you'd like to give us, uh, let you give you a second opinion before you file for social security, um, you can schedule a complimentary consultation. We will slide this slide out now. If you'd like to go ahead and schedule that and get on our calendar, you can do that right now by clicking that click here button. I want to talk a little bit about capital gains as well. We've been getting a lot of questions about capital gains and they've remained unchanged. So it's either zero, 15 or 20, depending on the tax bracket that you're in. However, there are some new changes that in this new law that open up opportunities. So anybody in the webinar on real estate, uh, not just your primary home, but uh, maybe a, a rental home or commercial property. If you own real estate, listen to this. Have you ever heard of a 1031 exchange? If you haven't, you, you need to know about this. In a 1031 exchange, when you sell one property and then purchase another property, uh, say you bought a property for $100,000 and now that property is worth two or $300,000. Well, you have a capital gain that you're going to pay capital gains tax on. Well, if you sell that property, you're going to have to pay that capital gain or you could 1031 exchange it buy another piece of property and defer the taxes, meaning the 300,000 just defers to the other property and you don't have to pay those taxes. That's called a 1031 exchange. Well, a lot of people, when they get into retirement, they don't want to deal with the real estate anymore. The, tenants and the trash and the turnover and all the right. stuff that comes with owning active real estate. And they want to go more passive and go to more investments. 
Well, we have, when it's suitable, we have 1031 options where you can go to a, um, a passive option, more of an investment style of real estate, and you can defer the capital gains. And uh, it's a great estate planning tool because when you pass that real estate, either the investment option or active real estate to your kids, well, they get what's called a step up in cost basis. Basically, whatever the, the, co the, the cost basis of that is, it goes to the value of what it is whenever you pass. Yeah. So now when you pass that $300,000 rental home to your kids, well, now the cost basis becomes 300 and they completely eliminate all of that tax. They never pay it. Yeah. Which is phenomenal. Yeah. So it's a great estate planning strategy. You, you, there's a lot of rules with it. You have to use a qualified intermediary. We offer those services. So if that's interesting, um, we would definitely recommend if you have real estate, it's worth looking into to avoid those, those capital gains taxes. Um, and, and, and so listen, if you've never talked to anybody about capital gains, if you've got large capital gains, a lot of new opportunities, and we'd love the opportunity to show you how you can save money on those taxes. Yeah. The next time we have that offer out, make sure you click on that and uh, book a book a time on, on our schedule. And we'll be happy to walk you through how that works. It's definitely something if you uh, have real estate, something to definitely look into. Uh, but we talked about PIAs, FRA, and now we're again talking about RMDs. What did that stand for again? That's required minimum distribution. And previously that was at the age of 70 and a half, where now it has been upgraded to 72, right? So the, the, the age has indeed changed. So, so, so we want to talk about what accounts do these affect again, right? So RMDs impact your 401k, your 403b, your IRA, your anything that's considered a tax deferred vehicle is what RMDs are impacting. And oftentimes people will, will, will not really know about these RMDs and often have a lot of questions. And um, what type of accounts, the good question is what type of accounts do RMDs not affect? They're not going to affect what's called a Roth IRA because a Roth IRA is after tax vehicles, right? So what happens if you miss one of these RMDs? There's penalty. Right? There's a there's a pretty sizable penalty uh, if you end up missing one of these, and, and, and we'll we'll get into that here here in a second. But basically, what happens when you put money into your 401k, your IRA, your 403p, 403b, your tax deferred these tax deferred vehicles? What you're basically doing is you're partnering with the with the uh, IRS. Right? Let that sink in sink in. Right? And when you partner with the IRS. It's not a 50-50 partnership, right? It's a 99-1 partnership. They say jump, you say how high. They say pay your taxes, you say how much. If, if you don't, they say, well, you're going to get penalized or you're going to jail or whatever they want to say. So when you are putting money into these tax deferred vehicles, there are stipulations and there are consequences if you don't do what they say. And oftentimes your retirement plan can then be put into what they tell you your retirement plan should be because you know it, honestly because you haven't paid taxes for as long as you've had this account and you know at 70 at 72 the irs said we want that money and we're gonna take that money so let's say that you have a fifteen thousand dollar rmd that you 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 missed right well what do we know we know that you're going to get a 25 percent excise tax on that that's $3,750 gone. That's a pretty big ouch, right? That's a pretty big oops. That's a pretty big uh-oh. That's money that you went without. That's money that you stored away. That's money that you expected to be there in retirement and it's gone just like that because you made a simple mistake. Well, okay, Mr. IRS, I made a mistake, right? You take your $3,700. I'm going to take the rest and I'm going to go home. Well, not exactly. If you're in the 30% tax bracket, they get an additional $4,500 in income tax, leaving you with $6,750 of your once $15,000. That's a pretty big difference, right? And it's a avoidable difference if one, you don't run into this excise tax and miss your RMDs. And what we often see is that a large portion of the population has a 
large portion of their net worth in their 401k, their IRA, their tax, their 403b, these tax deferred vehicles, right? So if you have, think about your own personal finances, right? Think about where a lot of your money is. Is it in your 401k? Is it in your IRA? If so, this, this is something that could be very impactful. So, so one thing that we want to talk about is, is Roth IRAs. All right. Who knows what a Roth IRA is? So a Roth IRA is what we call a after tax vehicle. So when you put the money in, you pay tax on it and then it grows tax free. So when you put money in, you pay the tax and it grows tax free. Now there's differences between a Roth contribution and a Roth conversion. They are, there are uh, stipulations on who can put, who can contribute to a Roth IRA and how much they contribute. But every single person on this webinar can do a Roth conversion, otherwise known as a, a backdoor Roth. So let's talk about how that actually works. So basically what would happen would be, let's say you have money in your 401k or your IRA. Well, you simply pay the tax on that now and you convert it to a Roth IRA and that Roth IRA then grows tax free. And at that point, we don't have to worry about these RMDs. And one of the biggest things that we're seeing now is what did I talk about earlier? I talked about how right now taxes are on sale between three and 4% for a majority of Americans. Taxes are actually on sale. So when's the best time to buy something, right? When it's on sale, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, you know, when things are on sale is when you should be buying. So we know now until 2025, that for a majority of Americans, taxes are on sale between three and 4%. So this is definitely something to be looking into. Definitely look into these Roth conversions. So again, what we would be doing is we would take money from our, from our IRA, pay the tax on it now because it's on sale, convert it to a Roth IRA, and then allow that to grow tax free. And then you can take that out whenever you want. You aren't obligated to take that out at 72. And if you miss taking it out and if you leave it there, there's no penalties on it like what you're seeing with this excise tax. So let's look at a simple example of, of how that would actually turn out. So let's say that you are a married couple and you have an in, and you are earning $60,250 and you're actually in the 12% tax bracket. Well, the top of the 12% tax bracket is $80,250. So you have a great opportunity to start doing Roth conversions in that section. So if you convert $20,000, that keeps you in the 12% tax bracket. We would not, rec obviously going over this, this would jump you up into the 22% tax bracket. We don't want to do that. We want to we want to do Roth conversions systematically year over year within our tax bracket. So we could potentially convert, and this is just, you know, these numbers are different for everybody, but in this scenario, to get the most out of your tax bracket, you could convert $20,000 each year and then pull off a portion of your money that was once tax deferred and put it in after tax dollars. This is simply diversifying yourself and causing your, not all your wealth to be in one bracket, right? So this is giving you more opportunity, more options and allowing you to, um, to diversify yourself. So if this is the first time you're hearing about Roth conversions, if you're not sure if Roth conversions make sense for you, if you're not sure what an RMD, an RMD is, we're going to go ahead and put this uh, lab session on the side here. So it's going to slide out. So go ahead and feel free to click on that. Feel free to, to look into that and to find a time in your schedule. That's going to work for you uh, to talk with us to see if a Roth conversion would make sense for you. So we're also going to talk a little bit about the, the future of U.S. taxation. This is what a lot of experts in the industry are saying, uh, what they expect the future to hold. So who knows what the current U.S. federal debt is? It's pretty high, right? It is a pretty high number. Look at that. 
Is that is that concerning? Is that concerning to you? That's twenty three trillion dollars, right? That is a big number. I'd say I'm concerned I'm concerned by that. But you, Sean? Yeah, it's a massive number. Yeah, that is a large, large number. You know, I do think that is a should be a concern. And look how this has consistently gone up higher and higher and higher. So uh, does the name David M. Walker mean anything to anybody? So basically, he was the Comptroller General during the Bush and the Clinton White House. About 15 years ago, he started saying, folks, we have a huge issue. We have a massive problem that is continuing to grow and grow and grow and grow. And you'll see how this number just grows and grows and grows here. And this is not a political conversation. This is a mathematical problem that we are going to have to address sooner or later. And we just continue to kick it down the road. But it is something that's going to need to be addressed, right? So let's 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 not think about this twenty three trillion dollars and the two plus trillion that was just put into place as with this national stimulus. Let's think about our own personal finances. If you are in debt, how do you get out of it? There's two options. How do you get out? Well, you can either spend less. You can spend less, or you can make more. Right. <laughs> that's Those are the only two options. <laughs> Spend less or, or, or yes, yeah, spend less or make more. That's it. So who thinks the, the government's going to spend less? Probably not. I'd like to see it, but I don't <laughs> think that's going to happen, right? Education's not going anywhere, nor should it. Medicare's not going anywhere, nor should it. The, the military's not going anywhere, nor should it. So what are the options? To make more, right? And how does the government make more? Well, they can turn on that printing press in the basement and let that thing just go and go and go, but that's gonna create, again, more issues. But by making more, they can tax you and me. They can tax us, right? They can tax their citizens. And what we see is that that is a huge, huge problem. And that is a problem that if you have a lot of your net worth in your 401k and your 403b and your IRA and these tax deferred vehicles, well, that could be a, a big issue. So, so let's, let's, so who thinks that, you know, I, I talked about how taxes are currently on sale, right? For a lot of Americans, taxes are on sale between three and 4%, but who still thinks they're paying a little bit too much in taxes? Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to pay my fair share, but man, it, it hurts when I'm writing those checks, checks to the government. Right? So look at this. So we've been told our entire lives to put money, put as much money as you can in your 401k and your IRAs, kick that tax can down the road, right? Continue to kick that down the road. Well, that would make sense if taxes were even, right? If, there, if, if we always knew what the tax rate would be, but we don't know this. This is the top marginal tax bracket. And look at this, in 1946, the top marginal tax bracket was 96%, folks. 96% for the top That's marginal tax outrageous. bracket. That is absolutely outrageous. So when we're told to put taxes, uh, to put as much money as we can away because we'll make less in retirement, well, when we work with clients, they often don't want, they don't want to make less in retirement. And two, we don't know what the tax rates are going to be in retirement. We know what they are now, and we know that they're on sale right now. However, what's going to happen in five years, in 10 years? Could taxes go up 5%? Could they go up 10%? Yeah, a lot of people think that they definitely could. And what we know is if you look at the, the 2000s here, for, we are at considerable low taxes in reference to the last century of, of, of uh, top, the top marginal tax bracket. So that's definitely something to consider. And I want to I want to illustrate this with a story. So Ronald Reagan, right? He was he was our president, right? But what did he do before he was president? He was, he was a movie star, right? He was a movie star. He was actually the governor of California. But when he was a movie star, he would make two movies a year. He would make two movies a year because when he made that third movie, that would move him up into the top marginal tax bracket where he's getting taxed at 96%. And at that point, you're basically just volunteering, right? So he would make two a year and then he would be, he would be done. 
So take a look, take a look at this here. You know, obviously we've talked about how many of our, many people have a lot of money in their 401ks and look how this since 1980 has gone up, up, up and up, man, look at 2000 and 2008, just flat line. And then it's continued to go up further and further. Well, we believe this is a, a place that, and a lot of experts are saying, this is where um, the IRS is planning to get their money, right? And what we've seen it with this new SECURE Act, where we know that when assets pass from the one generation to the next, they have seriously affected the taxation on that. And, they, and, and a lot of people don't even know about it, right? A lot of people, when we ask them about the SECURE Act, they say, well, what's that? So this is a large portion of where the IRS can go to get their, their, their taxation. And so let's, let's look at this. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to fight a lot of people on them thinking that taxes are going to go up, right? Well, we know in 2025, they're set to go back up three or 4%, depending on what tax bracket you're in, but could they go up 5%, 10%? Yeah. Let me show you. Definitely that. think so. Yeah, I think so. Let me show you how that would look. So let's say you have, uh, in your 401k, you have, uh, let's say you work really hard and you, you've saved a lot of money and you have $400,000 in, uh, in your IRA or 401k. And, uh, and the biggest thing we hear from people who are not interested in converting to Roth is, well, I just, I don't want to pay the tax. I don't have to right now. So I don't want to pay tax right now. And that may be true. And, and, and because if you pay tax on that money, you, you will have uh, less money essentially. So let's look at this. So if you pay tax, let's say 20% in taxes over the course of a, over the course of several years, obviously you couldn't convert 400 in one year, but over the course of 10 years, maybe, and you paid an average of 20% in taxes, how much would you have in your IRA if uh, you converted it to Roth? Because you understand that you don't really have $400,000 in your IRA. I mean, that's what the account statement shows. Uh, but when you take that out, you have to pay tax on it. So you don't actually have 400. If you paid 20% in tax on that over in taking it out, you would have actually 320,000, 20% less. So if you converted that to Roth, how much would you have? And you paid 20% in tax. In your Roth IRA, you would have 320,000. So as you can see, they're, they're the same, but here's where the Roth would make the biggest impact. So like Chris said, who thinks taxes could go up 5%? Right. Yeah. I don't have to convince you that that's not only uh, could happen, it probably will happen at some yeah. point in our lives because of this massive debt that we have and the stimulus package um, just tacked on top of that. So. Uh, if, if taxes went up 5%, now how much do you have in your IRA? Cause you got to pay 25% in tax. Yeah. So now you have, if you had to pay 25% in tax on that money, you have $300,000. Yeah. So for this individual that has $400,000 in their IRA or 401k, if taxes go up by just 5%, this person lost $20,000. Yeah. That's that partnership with just, the IRS. Just like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But what would happen if they had converted that to Roth IRA and the taxes go up? How much do they have? That's unchanged. Yeah. So this is that power of the Roth IRA and breaking that partnership of the, the their partnership with the IRS. And, and this is the thing that is so um, interesting when we see this is that who would it affect most? The people that have most of their money in the tax deferred dollars. Well, that's most of the people we meet yeah, because is. think about it. Your accountant is always looking in the rear view mirror. When you take in your taxes, you're saying, Hey, save me as much money on last year's taxes as you possibly can. So their job is to save you money on last year's taxes. Mm -hmm. So they're going to say, Oh, if we put a little bit more in tax deferred from last year, you'll save money on your taxes. That's their job. It's not their job to look into the future to your retirement and see what tax implications are going to happen then. That's our job. Yeah. That's your financial advisor's job. Yeah. But what we find is that most financial advisors aren't doing this. No, They're no. just not doing it. They're focused on, well, we're going to get you this return and this investment. They're not focused on this. So what has happened as a result of all of this is that people come to our office and they um, show us their assets. And the biggest portion is tax deferred. Mm -hmm. This is your IRA or 401k. If they have any Roth at all, it looks about like this. Yeah. And then, you have some taxable money, some money in the bank or a brokerage account. 
And this is what their buckets of money look like. As you can see, think about your net worth. I mean, just think about your personal net worth. Is most of your money in your 401k or IRA tax deferred dollars? For the majority of Americans, it's almost yeah, all of it. It is. So what, did, what are we talking about when we talk about converting to Roth? All we're talking about is, yeah, pay a little tax on that now and diversify your tax status. I mean, you've heard diversification. Mm -hmm. You should diversify your assets. Well, nobody's talking about diversifying your tax buckets, diversifying your tax status. So all we're talking about is shrinking that each year, shrinking that tax deferred bucket to add a little bit to your Roth bucket. That's all we're saying. The next year we do it again. We shrink a little bit of your tax deferred bucket to add it to your Roth bucket. That's all we're talking about here is, is simply transitioning. So when you get to retirement, you have a more diversified, uh, diversified tax buckets so that that gives you more flexibility in retirement. And then that's going to decrease your R and D and it's going to help all around. So look, I don't know what you believe about the future of U.S. taxation. With this looming national debt, we feel that taxes have nowhere to go but up. The government just can't seem to figure out how to spend less. So there's only one way to more, make more money, and that's to tax us and let the record show that they made their intentions clear when they passed that SECURE Act. Yeah. They're coming after those tax deferred dollars, whether it's in your lifetime or when you pass those assets to your kids. Well, that's money that you've worked hard for, yeah. right? That's money that you have went without. That's money that you stowed away to make sure that you were taken care of in retirement. Yeah. And to make sure that if you were taken care of, that you would pass that to your kids. You're the next generation. Exactly. However, with the new Secure Act, that's going to be gone yeah. very, well, very quickly and much more, much quicker than it would have before. A big portion of that is a going to be gone. Big portion is so. Yeah, that and if you've never uh, gone through, we would love the opportunity to do that. I'm going to pop that offer. Yeah, up this just is so a, you have the opportunity to to schedule that time. If this is a big concern for you, definitely click on there and look for a a time for uh, on our calendar. And and um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the how we do this, what this lab session will look like. So typically, the first thing we do is say, "What questions did you have from the webinar?" Did you have questions about Roth conversions? What questions do you have? And so we answer your questions. That's the first thing we want to answer your questions because we know right now is not the best time uh, to answer your personal financial questions in an online webinar. So we use technology to do that. And what that looks like to build this plan, all we're doing is we're inputting your, uh, your assets and then we overlay your retirement goals. How much do you want to make in retirement? How much do you want to travel? Yeah. These sort of goals. When we overlay those goals, then it spits out this probability of success. And it's a really complicated software that makes a really complicated equation really easy to understand to see if you're going to hit your goals. Well, and then we have the opportunity to completely stress test it, right? What happens if we have a huge inflation? What happens if there's social security cuts? What happens if you're the high income earner passes away soon, right? If you've never stress tested your uh, retirement plan, it's a living, breathing thing, right? It, we can absolutely stress test it and see, are you going to be okay? And what type of activities could cause you to have issues down the road? Exactly. And so look, I want to talk a little bit about that lab session. This will uh, take place right now via Zoom meeting or just over the phone. Um, and what we can do is basically answer your questions. It typically takes, we plan for about an hour. It takes about an hour um, or depending on how many questions you have, if you don't have that many questions, it doesn't take that long. Uh, but uh, listen, here's a good reason why we think you should take advantage of it. If you do not have a retirement plan, and I'm not talking about retirement investments, I'm talking about an actual plan, that picture on the box where it pulls all of your assets together to show you what you're going to be able to make in retirement. If you don't have that retirement plan, this is a great opportunity to get one at, at no cost. Um, if you're looking to minimize your taxes or optimize your social security because you can see the whole picture, this lab session is a, a great opportunity for that. If you've never truly tested the strength of your current plan. So, um, you know, have you ever uh, taken your plan and stress tested like Chris was talking yeah. about? And really, if there's any doubt in your mind that you're going to run, run out of money in retirement, this is a great opportunity. And this is how this works. Typically, we're just going to, you know, we're going to build this plan by 
by going through your assets. We're going to enter your assets. We're going to enter your social security, any pensions that you have, any real estate. We're going to enter that all in. Then we're going to ask you about your goals. What, what kind of goals do you have? Once we enter that out, it's going to spit out that probability of success. And we're going to be able to tell you if you're on track to hit your yeah. retirement goals. So I'll, I'll end with this story that, you know, I grew up uh, racing dirt bikes and loved racing dirt bikes, still enjoy it, still race and ride today. But had, uh, as you can imagine, I was an orthopedic surgeon's <laughs> best friend yeah. with all the injuries I had. And I, at one point, dislocated my shoulder. Now, I didn't think that was a, a huge injury. They said I could rehab it and get it back going. But uh, unfortunately, I dislocated it four times. And at that point, we decided it was probably time to get some work done and, and, and repair that shoulder. So uh, we go to see an orthopedic specialist. One of the uh, I was living in Indiana at the time, and this was one of the greatest orthopedic groups. They were known for working on the Indianapolis Colts and IndyCar drivers and all these um, well-known people and athletes. So we went to their shoulder specialist. And uh, he said, yeah, we can do that surgery. It's just an arthroscopic surgery. We go in with the little incisions and we can repair your, your shoulder. And so he's like, unfortunately, it does have a six month recovery time and another three months of therapy. But we did the surgery, had the six months of recovery and three months of therapy. And I, I got released to, to uh, go have fun again, essentially. And I was doing a jumping jack and my arm fell out again. It was it was devastating, obviously. Um, so we go back to the doctor and he says, ah, that procedure only has a 50% success rate. <sighs> like that would have been nice to know before yeah. I went under the knife. So he says, look, we will open you up. I'll get a lot better you know, view of what's going on and I'll be able to repair the problem. So go back under the knife. It's a little more invasive, a little more painful this time, but another six months of recovery, another three months of therapy. This time I'm throwing a wiffle ball underhand. And it comes out again. And at that point, um, we decided to get a second opinion. Yeah. It was time. <laughs> so I went to a, another sports medicine uh, orthopedic surgeon. He does the exact same surgery, uh, the exact same procedure. It's another six months of recovery, another three months of rehab. But I've never had another issue since. And that taught me a really important lesson of the value of a second opinion. And, and oftentimes when people are facing... Uh, medical uh, emergencies and medical issues that they they understand the value of second opinion. Mm -hmm. But what we see oftentimes is that when we're talking about your finances, people just don't. They just they just don't get a second opinion. They say, ah, it's, it's probably good enough. And you could be missing. You could be paying an, a huge amount more taxes than you need to. And so, and not getting the full advantage of your Social Security. Exactly. So look, all we're offering is a complimentary second opinion. Let us give you. Uh, let us help you build that picture on the box and let it give us the opportunity to give you a second opinion on, on what you've got. So listen, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope um, that it didn't leave you with more questions and answers. But if you have questions, listen, we are here for you. I'm going to slide this offer out uh, one last time. And uh, if you would like to take advantage of that complimentary consultation, again, it's not going to cost you anything. There's no obligation, anything like that. Um, but if you'd like to ask those questions, we just want to make sure that you know that we're available here for you and we would love to answer those questions for you. So thank you for being a part of this and I'm going to leave this up uh, so you can schedule that time below. Thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you this week about your questions. Thanks so much. Take care. Be safe.